Our, our next speaker is Dr Andrew Burgess. Dr Burgess is the head of the Cell Division Lab right here in the Kinghorn Cancer Centre. He graduated with first class honours in 1999 and was awarded his PhD in 2004 from the University of Queensland. He has received several prestigious awards and fellowships throughout his career, including an NHMRC CJ Martin Fellowship, a postdoctoral fellowship from French Foundation Rachin Medical, and he is currently a Cancer Institute New South Wales Future Research Leader Fellow. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Burgess. Thank you. Thanks very much. How is everyone? We're all okay? We've got some pretty pictures. It's going to be a nice, fun, short talk, so I'll get started. Um, it's going to be a bit of a change. So the, we just had an amazing talk about bone and about your whole body. Um, I'm going to come from the other angle. We're going to start talking about the tiny little things that make up everything called your cells. Does everyone know what a cell is in your body? You all know you've got cells in your body? All right, well, you're made up of all lots of little cells. And I'll just, I'm going to hold up the end of my little finger here. Does anybody want to have a guess at just how many cells might be in my little tip of my finger here? Two million, I've got two million. Anybody want to go above that? <laughs> going once. Twenty-seven million. So how much we got here? Twenty-seven million. Twenty-seven million. All right. Anybody want to go, go, go higher than that? Billions. You're getting close. It's about probably. It's a bit hard to guess, but it's probably about five to ten billion cells in the in my finger, end of my finger there. So that gives you a, a, an approximation. There's enough, probably about as many people, in the end of my finger as there are cells on the planet Earth. Okay. So that's a lot of cells. That's set, you know between five to ten billion cells. So, in fact, in your body, you have approximately 37 trillion cells. That's, the, that's an approximation. It's always a bit hard. Depends, you know, some people have a bit more, some people have a bit less. So that's a lot. I, I don't think we can actually really grasp just how many that is. But that's, that's a lot. So, I mean, if you think about it, at the end of your finger, probably about 5 to 10 billion cells. It's a lot. And if you're thinking about cancer, when you get the tiny little lump of cancer that you can start to feel somewhere in your body, there's going to be billions of cells in that tiny little lump already. So that's a lot we've got to get rid of. And so once it starts metastasizing, we'll get to this. These are the kind of problems we're facing, so it's not a simple, simple issue. And all of these cells in your body are proliferating. Some are proliferating more, so they say they're proliferating, they have to make a copy of themselves and divide and make another copy to replace themselves. So in approximately about 10 years, you'll actually have replaced pretty much every cell in your body and you're a new person. So you've probably all become new persons quite a, quite a few times. <laughs> I actually just found out, I think Andrew mentioned that the age here is 35, the mean age. So I'm, I'm actually getting one of the older, I'm 37 now, so I'm starting to feel old. But anyway. Ah. Um, <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Um, so you can see some of these take a long time, so your bone cells, for example, which we just heard, can take 25 to 30 years to get replaced, so these don't get replaced very often, whereas some of the other ones are only lasting a few, few days, so if you have skin cells on your skin on your arm, that, a couple of days, then they're, they're gone, you've got new ones replaced all the time. So how does this happen? This is the bit that I'm interested in, and we've got a nice movie here. This is actually a real live cell that we've taken on the microscopes downstairs in this building here, and what we've done, this is, I think, a great example of weird science that you wouldn't expect to have an impact that actually has an impact on stuff we're doing in cancer research. So what I've done is I've taken a little bit of the fluorescent part of a jellyfish and we've tagged that onto the DNA here which is the genetic material in red so we've taken a red fluorescent protein from jellyfish and we've made it fused to the DNA and then we've taken the green fluorescent protein from a jellyfish and fused it to a thing called my microtubules which are this like it's like the structure or the bricks of your house for example. Okay, and so what happens is that every cell, you start off with your genes here, all your DNA. Have you, has everyone heard of DNA? Yep. So this, this red bit here is all your DNA, and it's got to make a, a perfect copy, and it does this here. And this takes about 20 hours in your body, roughly, if, once it starts deciding it's going to make a copy. It takes about 20 hours to make a copy of it, and then in about half an hour, what it does is it condenses all of that DNA up into a thing called chromosomes which you see it's starting to do here. So you can see just here, you've got your chromosomes here. All right, so you've got here, you can start to see your chromosomes. They all get lined up into pairs, and then you might have to remember back to high school biology. It's a long time ago for all of us, I imagine. But um, they then get separated into two perfect identical cop copies, and so you end up now with two perfect cells. And it's a perfect system. Works really, really well for most of the time. But it has to do it perfectly, and if it doesn't do it perfectly, then things can go wrong. And this is an example. So here is an example of a, a cell. And it's going to try and do it, except it doesn't do it quite properly. So you can see it gets most of it there. You'll just see, it's a bit hard to see, but there's actually a little chromosome that's stuck at the back here and it just, just doesn't want to get in there. And what ends up happening is, as you can see, I've taken some screenshots here, is that chromosome gets stuck in between the two cells. Now what can this, 
normally would happen is that cell would then be killed. But it can also, some cells will survive. And this can be a way that you get unstable chromosomes. It's what we call chromosome instability. And this is a hallmark of all cancers. They all have unstable chromosomes and they all tend to do this kind of thing. And this also leads to another big problem, which is a, a thing called tumor heterogeneity. So that's where, even though we talk about tumors and everyone sort of thinks there's as one entity, what we actually know now is that these are actually mm, all micro little tumors and every little part of that tumor is often quite different. And that creates problems. And so we'll get to that in a minute. <coughs> So here's generally how cancer happens. So we start off with one of those mutations, so that's one cell that just doesn't divide quite properly, and that can cause problems, and that maybe causes it to start proliferating too much. But cancer is actually a combination of two things. You have excessive proliferation and also bad proliferation. It's not doing it properly. So again, you're creating more errors and more errors, and things going wrong more and more times. So you start creating more and more mass, things are doing it wrong, and each cell becomes almost different. So you've got one cancer, it gets mutated a little bit, and then that creates a new mutation and a new mutation, and it starts steamrolling from there. So by the time you've got something the size of your finger, 10 billion cells at this end that you can start feeling and you start getting a bit sick and go to the doctor, you've got a really heterogeneous tumour often. Often there's uh, lots of different types of cancer cells in there. Some of them may be not really much of a problem, and others could be quite bad for you, and they might start moving into your bloodstream and wanting to go and grow places they shouldn't. That's not something we want. So, what have we done in the past? Generally what we do is we treat you based on where the cancers originated from. So for example, if you've got breast cancer, we'll treat you as though you've got breast cancer and we'll give you a certain drug, drug X. Everybody on breast cancer will get tamoxifen, for example. We now get, it then has moved on, we've started to segregate those based on a few other additional things. But still, essentially, we still treat tumours based on which part of the body they've come from. And what we're starting to know now, thanks to the genomic revolution and the sequencing machines that we've now got at the centre here, is that perhaps your breast cancer actually might look more like a chiroctal cancer. And so you might be better off getting drug Z than drug X, but we would not give you that because historically we've only treated breast cancers as breast cancers and not given you a colorectal drug. And it's not allowed on the PBS, for example. We're not allowed to give you drugs that are not assigned for that tumor. So we're at a real crossroads in cancer at the moment where we're starting to get all this amazing information and we're now hopefully going to be able to actually start giving you the right drug. But there's a few technical problems we've got to get through before that. So as I mentioned, we've got tumor heterogeneity. So here's a what a tumour might look like. You've got all these different kinds of actual cancer cells in there. Some are going to respond differently to others. So what we might do is, as we said, you give you drug X for your breast cancer, and it will possibly kill off most of the tumour. But some of these cells may be resistant. You might have a specific mutation in one of these cells that makes it resistant to that drug, drug X. In which case, you think you've got rid of the cancer, killed off 90% of it, but there's still a few cells left. Five years later, those cells have grown back again. You've got another billion cells, and these are resistant. So we give you the drug again, and nothing happens, and then it's too late. Okay? So alternatively, what might happen is, as I mentioned, is that you might have a breast cancer that actually looks a bit more like a colon cancer, and you, you're given the, the drug for breast cancer, but it doesn't work, because it's actually more like a colon cancer, or it's got a completely different um, genetic makeup than all of the other breast cancers that tend to happen. In which case, you don't do very well at all, and all, before you've had a chance to get the right drug, you're already, unfortunately, passed away. Mm -hmm. So, how can we improve on this? How can we make this better? Um, oh, sorry, I forgot about this. <laughs> this is my, boy, uh, my son here, he's six, he had his birthday party on the weekend, and um, this is a little movie of them, they're all playing Xbox. Everyone heard of an Xbox? Yeah, yeah. And they're supposed to be doing this game called Dance Dance Revolution, and I just... They're all supposed to be doing the movements exactly as they are on the screen. And I just thought it was a perfect example of cancer cells because they are all doing something completely different. Even though they're all supposed to be doing the same movements at the same time, they're all behaving a little bit differently. And I thought that was just a, a lovely little example. All right, that was a bit of a side note. <coughs> so here we go. This is the cancer. You've got this heterogeneous cancer. It's all mixed of uh, all different kinds of cancer cells. How are we going to improve? Well, the first step is we've got these amazing new sequencing machines that Andrew, the other Andrew, <laughs> alluded to a, few, a little earlier ago, these sequencing machines. And what the idea is that we're going to hopefully do here is being able to sequence all of these tumours 
and sequence all the, and in fact, we're now going to have the technology to actually start sequencing individual cells, not just the whole tumour, but we're actually going to be able to start in sequencing individual cells in the, in the near future. We can then, once we know the makeup of individual cancer cells and what's driving that specific cell, we can start pairing that with the right drug treatment and, and know that, okay, this cell is going to respond to a certain treatment. So some of you, if you've had cancer or you know people, you may have noticed some of these different treatments on the side here. And that's the, we're at the moment that we're hopefully going to be able to start pairing up. We can already do this in some cases, but over the next 10 years or so, we're really going to be able to start ramping up, being able to pair the right mutations to the right drugs. And well, at least that's the, that's the hope. And so that's where I'm just going to leave you with that and uh, thank all the people in my lab. So this is my lab here. I've got um, a, a, a number of young people. We, I have a height limit as well for people in my lab. They will have to be 170 centimetres tall. Um, and uh, I guess if, if, if there's time for a couple of questions, I'd be happy to take some. Yeah, I, sp I speak quickly, I apologise. <laughs> Oh, yes, we here we you go. You said you're going to kill them one by one. Now, if you've got two humans in that little yeah. round, how will you kill them one by one? Well, it was a, it was a bit of a provocative title. <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea is that I think what I was trying to really encapsulate was that it's not just killing... We, we, the tumour is a mix often. Like sometimes some tumours are very homogeneous, so that you might just have one tumour type, and they tend to be the patients that miraculously recover and oh. get rid of. They, tends to be often the case is that you might not have a very heterogeneous tumour. What we're starting to see now is that because of that heterogeneity, you might need to go through multiple treatments. So you might get given mm. tr drug X, kill off most of the cells. That might allow you then, for example, to get surgery or go on to another drug or another drug after that. So it'll become more of a chronic management, I believe, of, of cancer. Um, so in some sense, it is killing one cell at a time, but hopefully you'll kill like a, bi a million cells at a time or a billion cells at a time of the 10 billion cancer cells that you have in your body. So, but you might need multiple treatments to do that. Are you having trouble getting, uh, what would you kill them with heat or something? Do you, or do you use a medical, um, it's, know, But that's the idea of like, uh, if I just go back, is, is really some cells will be resistant to certain things, others not, depending on that sort of genetic mutation makeup, that, that whatever's driving that cell to proliferate badly in the first place. So in some cases, it could be radiation therapy that might work best. Classical radiation therapy, some cells could be very sensitive. In others, it could be a, a specific um, targeted therapy, so something like Herceptin, for example, that targets a very unique, specific mutation. So it's, it's really just about trying to match up the right treatment. It could be heat, for example. These are combination therapies often. Yes, mm. I've got one over the back there. Yes. Yes, Me. yes, yes, you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can you, can you ever see a point where genome testing would be part of preventative medicine? Uh, I, th I believe that's where we're hopefully going to go. I think that the, we're starting to get to that point now that we're at the, the this called the thousand dollar genome, although in Australia with the exchange rate it's more like two thousand dollars. <laughs> but um, we are getting to that point. I think it needs, still needs to come down a bit. We still need to work out the, a, a lot of the technicalities. But I believe possibly within the next ten years or so that that's where you're going to be moving to. It could take longer. It's, it's, it's this is such a new area that it's difficult to predict exactly how long it'll take. But I, I think that that's an obvious step at this point. Well, I'm over here, yes. um, and uh, the public able to ask to get tested and pay for you guys to do that now? Um, I'm not going to speak exactly because I don't know the technicalities of here, but there are services that you can. So there's something called 23andMe, which is a run out of the United States, and that does some limited genetic testing, and that will actually although they've just had some rulings, so I won't know exactly. They can report back what your mutations are, but I don't think they're allowed to give you any medical information about what that could be. I think there was a ruling in there by, by, by the NIH just a few months ago. But you can get that done. Um, at the moment, I believe here it's more for, for research purposes, yeah. so I don't believe it's open to the public yeah. yet. Yeah. But obviously that is where it's moving towards. But I believe it'll probably start more in a, a, a situation of a <coughs> A, a, a clinical situation, not just a general over public, you know, it'll be targeted there. Oh, got lots of questions. Oh, <laughs> Maybe one more and one then more. we'll finish. Um, this gentleman here seems to be sorry. patient and yep. not suffering. Uh, are are uh, laser treatments uh, efficient at killing off all of the uh, targeted cells? Um, are you talking of more about skin cancer in this case? No, Oh, like a radiation or, yeah, uh, yeah, radiation is very good uh, and there's some amazing things that are in terms of targeting the radiation. So they've even got some, I know there's, I think there's somebody out in, in, at Sydney Uni or Westmead that have got 
one of the problems is that you can with radiation is that you might have to kill the whole uh, area mm. but we're, we're really making some big headways in being able to really just focus in on the area that needs to be targeted and so even just when you're lying on the radiation machine just your breathing alone causes your all your organisms mm. to shift so that, but they're starting to develop techniques to be able to actually track in real time using MRI combined with radiation to be able to track your breathing movement so that the radi radiation focus stays on your tumour rather than starting to spread around everywhere. So there's lots of just basic, you know, I guess mechanical problems that are, that are being sorted out. And radiation therapy, I think, will continue to be a very important part of cancer treatment. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.